amazing turnout. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Gabrielle Griffiths. I'm the outreach Robert. coordinator. <laughs> I'm Gabrielle Griffiths. I'm the outreach coordinator here at Wellfleet Library. Before we begin, if you could all please silence your cellular devices. That would be much appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to note that the books tonight are being sold for $10 each. So if you'd like to buy them, they are in the back. Um, and now I get to I had the privilege of introducing our speakers. Um, Daniel Biddle teaches journalism at the University of Pennsylvania and at the University of Delaware, formerly the Philadelphia Inquirer Investigations Editor. He has worked in nearly every phase of reporting and editing. His investigative stories on the courts won a Pulitzer Prize and other national no awards. And for our second speaker, Murray Dubin, author of South Philadelphia, South Philadelphia, Mummer's Memories in the Melrose Diner, was a reporter and editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer for 34 years before leaving the newspaper in 2005. He lives in Philadelphia with his wife, wife Libby Rosal. Um, I'm really excited and happy to be introducing <laughs> our speakers tonight. So please join me in welcoming for this really excellent book, um, Murray Schumann and um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Murray and I are very high tech, so bear with me. Everybody hear me okay? <laughs> All right. Now, I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to be here at a library that I've only been going to since I was a tot and to have all of you here to hear about this experience that Murray and I got to have uh, learning about this special group of men and women. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thanks to Jennifer Wirtkin. Thanks to Sharon for putting me in touch with Jennifer, or else this wouldn't have been able to happen. Um, I will start off by reading to you from the first page of our book, Tasting Freedom. Uh, from the preface, which is called October 10th, 1871. And I wanna, want you to think about uh, walking back into a different world. It's 1871, and black men's right to vote in this country had just been won. The offer of political power, the talk of it, the vision that black leaders had of obtaining the ballot had become a reality. And that invested people of color with a new power and made them a threat to powerful white people. So it's the afternoon of October 10th, 1871. We'll go one more forward. That's the guy in this opening scene. The young white man had the number 27 tattooed on the back of his hand and a bandage around his head when he began shooting at a colored man named John Fawcett. He missed. Fawcett, who was a hod carrier from the Philadelphia neighborhood of Frankfurt, ran up South Street to escape. Joined by a crowd, the bandaged man followed him. Fawcett saw a cellar door that was open in front of a store in the middle of a block. But before he could dive in, a white boy stuck a foot out and tripped him. Fawcett scrambled to his feet, and the bandaged man fired again. That same afternoon, election day in Philadelphia, about a mile away, Another Negro, a school teacher with the Roman sounding name of Octavius Valentine Caddo, left a pawn shop on 3rd Street and began walking home. People on the street knew who he was. An orator who had shared stages with Frederick Douglass, a second baseman on the city's best black baseball team, a teacher at a black school of national renown, and an activist 
who had fought in the state capitol and on the streets for equal rights. He was 32 years old. It was Election Day 1871 in the busy South Street area, which was the institutional and political heart of black Philadelphia, had been rocked by violence since the night before. Was it all the squires doing? White policemen and Democrats who answered to him were attacking black voters, and scores of them had gone to the hospital. No, I'm getting ahead of myself. I thought I had a slider. slide. Anyway, Cato had sent his pupils home early. And rather than going directly home to his boarding house, he chose a safer route up Lombard Street to 9th, near his fiancée's home, you'll hear about her later, and then down to South Street, where he lived at 814. Cato walked with an assured athletic gait, as if his right to the pavement were guaranteed, which it was. But only lately, scores Oh, excuse me. Memories of slavery haunted every colored home. Generations of men and women had risked their lives to claim the simplest of rights, to learn in a schoolhouse, to serve in the army, to ride on the railways, to cast a ballot. Now those rights were being tested. Caddo turned onto South Street at the moment when, in W.E.B. Du Bois' words, Americans of color were first tasting freedom. As Cato walked east, the bandage man, there he is, was looking for more Negroes to hurt, more Negroes who would not be able to vote that day. He passed Cato nonchalantly, but once he was five steps beyond, the bandage man turned and crouched. A young girl at 822 South shouted to Cato, Look out for that man! The bandaged man was pulling out his gun. Your gun is my This is fun. Is my voice going to explode? (laughs) Very high tech. Nothing. Is that better? Can people hear me? Good. Let's just put this down. Hi. Um, Thank you very much for coming. There are a lot of you, and I'm sure this makes Dan feel very good, and that's important because he doesn't get out as much as he used to. I'm not loud enough? You can't hear me? I'm sorry. Gabrielle, help me, please. How's that? Okay, let's turn it off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dan and I have been very fortunate and have had the opportunity to speak very often at all sorts of venues sort of all over the country. And one of the things we like the best about speaking in public is the Q&A at the end, and there will be a question and answer period when this is over. When we first began talking, we were surprised at how polite people were. They really then ask very difficult questions. One of the questions they often asked is, how did you two come to write this book? Which is an absolutely legitimate question of any author. But we thought what they really wanted to know was how did you two white guys write this book? (laughs) Because this is really a black history book. And I'd be happy to answer that question so you don't have to ask it. A long time ago, about 25 years ago, I was working at the Enquirer and working part-time trying to write a book about South Philadelphia, which is the neighborhood I grew up in and the oldest neighborhood in Philadelphia. I was doing research at a place called the Library Company, which is the oldest library in the nation, started by Benjamin Franklin. And while there, a wonderful librarian, a wise man, gave me an academic essay written in the 1960s or 70s about a man named Octavius Caddo, who I'd never heard of. Like most academic essays, it wasn't written very well. But it was full of fascinating information about Caddo, who was an extraordinary figure. 
I grew up in Philadelphia, I was educated in Philadelphia, and I felt both embarrassed and a little angry that I had never heard of him. And for the next couple of years, on my own, I sort of collected as much information on Caddo as I could, not knowing what to do about it, but thinking he was worth, he was worth my effort to write something about him. There are about four or five paragraphs on Caddo in my South Philadelphia book, but that wasn't enough. Fast forward a few years into the early 2000s, late 1900s, and Dan Biddle, my colleague, um, sees me at the Inquirer offices and says to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not doing much, but I'm sort of obsessed with this uh, black civil rights hero from the 1800s. And Dan, good reporter that he is, said, who? <laughs> I said, Dan, you never heard of this guy. No one's ever heard of this guy. And Dan, good reporter that he is, said, who? <laughs> and I said, I understand. You really don't know who this guy is. It's going to be embarrassing. You're going to say, I don't know who that guy is. And he wasn't embarrassed at all. And he asked me who one more time. I was getting a little angry now. Uh, and I sensed that he really wanted to know, and I almost didn't trust him. But I said, thinking he would not know who it is, Octavius Cata. And he looked at me, and to my shock, said, I am obsessed with him too. <laughs> Now, I don't want to hear this. Still Thank you. Okay. If Dan Biddle was obsessed with that, I'm thinking that he wants to write a book too. <laughs> and I'm thinking that he's thinking, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And I don't know what to say. And he's not saying a word. We're staring at each other. <laughs> now, I make it sound like this took a long time. I mean, it was probably 15 seconds. But it felt like a duel. Without weapons other than the computer mouse near each of us. Um, and I didn't know how to handle it. And Dan didn't know how to handle it. And we looked at each other some more. And ultimately, both of us put our right hands out, shook hands, and agreed to write something about Cato together. Lucky for us. Technical wizards that we are. Google had just come into its own around that time. And uh, we've joked since, ever since, that Google probably should have had the third byline because so much of our research kind of began then. And early on, after we shook hands and agreed to, to take on this idea, uh, at the end of my workday at the Inquirer, I would take his name and run it through Google every way that I could think of. And there was not a lot out there and as, as real historians know, and I know there are some present tonight, when you research the 19th century, you have to account for bad spelling and for initials as opposed to whole names. So quite often in old records, his name would come up as O.V. Caddo or with the last name Caddo misspelled with one T, or his father's name, William Thomas Caddo, would come up as W.T. Caddo. So I learned to look that way, and in so doing, one night, I stumbled onto a note that was on a genealogy website and put up there by a black man in Virginia named Leonard Smith. And what Leonard had posted uh, uh, said, was there anyone out there on the internet that could help him out? He was looking for records of his great uncle, W.T. Caddo, and W.T. Caddo's son, O.V. Caddo. Well, I thought, I gotta talk with this guy. And I 
emailed Leonard and asked if he'd share his phone number with me, which he did. And within, within a day, he and I, total strangers, black guy in Virginia, white guy in Philadelphia, yakking like old friends on the phone. And um, it, was, it was really one of my favorite interviews of my life as a, as a journalist. Um, Leonard revealed, among other things, that he and his wife, Maxine, had tried for years to dig up more information about these ancestors in their family. They'd even taken a trip to Philadelphia from Virginia to see if they could locate Caddo's grave marker, and they were unable to. And he said one reason for his obsession was that when Leonard's grandmother was still living in her 90s, whenever the name Rosa Parks came up in the news, Leonard's grandmother would say, Leonard, Rosa Parks sat down, but she wasn't the first. Your great uncle sat down. And Leonard told me on the phone he did not know what she meant by that and had this aching desire to find out. And he shared with me that night a lot of the family lore about Octavius Caddo and his father, the great uh, William Thomas Caddo. And, you know, I told him what Murray and I were up to, that we were hell-bent on seeing if there was a book in this man's life. And Leonard said, look, I'll help you guys any ways that I can. I, too, am obsessed with Caddo's life. <laughs> All I ask is that you have Denzel play him in the movie. <laughs> Well, that was like 2002 when Denzel Washington was young enough to play this man in a movie. That's Cato at about age, age 30. Um, and we thought this little project would take us a year. We'd, we'd both get a year off from the paper. We'd beg our boss for a book leave. Thought it would take maybe one year since it was a biography, a narrow look at this one amazing Renaissance man who led a fight to integrate the streetcars, who led a fight to bring about interracial baseball, who fought to integrate the Union Army, had a whole literary side, lectured about Tennyson, of all things. Maybe a year. And it wound up taking seven years to do this book. Why is that, Dad? <laughs> you might think maybe it was because we were both, you know, in, well, one of us was in late middle age by then, and one of us really quite old. <laughs> It took us way longer than a year because of something Leonard tried to explain to us the first time we had lunch with him down in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. After sharing what he knew with us, he says, look, you have, to, you have to understand when you go about this, don't make too much of this one man, he said. There were a hundred O.V. Caddos. We thought he was being humble, because it's, it's people who were in his own family tree, um, Octavius and William Caddo. And the truth of his words grew and grew on us, and I dare say still growing on us today, that what, what made O.V. Caddo important was the movement that he was but one person in. He and his father were surrounded with men and women of extraordinary courage and shrewdness and ability to take the least amount of political resources and turn it into a whole tidal struggle for equal rights. They fought to integrate the streetcars, which were the horse-drawn way to commute to your job in industrial Philadelphia in the 1860s. They fought to integrate the Union Army. They fought to integrate schools, which doesn't sound like that difficult to think, except that this guy had grown up in Charleston, South Carolina, where by the time he was born, the South Carolina legislature, us Pennsylvanians are familiar with how badly a state legislature can behave. South Carolina legislatures, legislators, by the time of his birth, had decided a great way to keep civic order was to deny people of color, whether free or enslaved, an education. They made literacy a crime for people of color. They made it a crime to teach people of color, whether free or enslaved, to read and write. If you were a white teacher and you broke that law, you could be fined. And if you were a teacher of color, 
you could be whipped for that crime of teaching. That's the world that this guy's mom and dad grew up in. And by some feat of physics and relentless will, his parents and the parents of his friends, having been faced with that odious thing of being denied an education, made a point of making sure their kids got the best educations that a black kid in that era could possibly get by hook or by crook. And they, what they raised was a generation of activists, like the modern activists that most Americans do know something about, the Martin Luther Kings, the Rosa Parks, the Ella Bakers, all those brave men and women who risked life and limb to bring about a greater degree of equal rights in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Well, Cato and the men and women of his generation fought those same fights 100 years earlier. And like the modern freedom riders that we're more familiar with, he and his friends, men and women, uh, came back from many of their meetings or their marches with their heads bloodied or with their bones broken or their churches burned or their homes ransacked by organized white mobs. And yet they went back for more, like those modern men and women. They went back for more and they got hurt again and they fought and they lost many, many battles and suffered greatly, but they won some enormous victories. And yet, I dare say, most of you have never heard of most of them. I teach now, so you got to remember, a lot of this is going to be on the exam. <laughs> We're going to flip forward to the Greek One of those mobs. People know who this guy was? Frederick Douglass? Quick show of hands. Not too bad. That's Douglas Citizen. In about his 40s. Henry Highland Garnett, quick show of hands. You all know who he was, right? One or two. Not very good. He should be on the national history exam. He was Frederick Douglass's equal. You guys don't know who he was. Abraham Lincoln knew him well. When Lincoln was killed and Mary Todd Lincoln had that awful task of giving away some of Lincoln's prized possessions. Mary Todd Lincoln gave one of Abe Lincoln's prize walking sticks to Frederick Douglass and the other to this man, Henry Highland Garnett, as a token of her husband's, the esteem that he held them in. Well, uh, the other thing we learned in all this research was not only that there was this amazing network of women and men uh, all over the North and some of them even in the, in the South before slavery ended and with a with an alliance of contacts literally around the world as it, as it existed in the 1850s and 60s. But uh, another learning experience for us was the extent to which uh, those men and women, for the simple thing of going around this country and campaigning against slavery and in favor of equal rights, became targets of white violence. And I don't mean eggs being thrown, although that happened a lot, or, or insults, or death threats. I mean organized white mob violence, and not just by impoverished white people, but by the better off classes. A lot of the riots that people like Garnett and Douglas and Caddo uh, were at the losing end of were led by white people in nice clothing, gentlemen of property and standing. Merchants, mayors, members of Congress. Um, now, they had a few white allies. Lucky for us, some of them were more or less from around here. Lucretia Mott, quick show of hands, should be on the exam. That's not too bad. Anybody know where Lucretia Mott grew up? No one. Now you've got to read up on her. Grew up in Nantucket. The famous Coffin family daughter of a sea captain who'd be away for, for years on end. So Lucretia, as the oldest kid, kind of had to run the family. Uh, and maybe that helps explain why she became, I think, the bravest of the white abolitionists and equal rights advocates. Put her body on the line in a political way at a time when women weren't supposed to engage in politics at all, much less on behalf of people of color. William Lloyd Garrison, class, not too bad. Newburyport, Massachusetts, not too far away. Probably the second bravest white abolitionist. 
Anybody know what happened to Garrison in the streets of Boston? These people were upset with him for being anti-slavery and making a big stink about um, fighting slavery. Whites drags this little man through the streets of Boston at the end of a rope. Who else we got? Sarah Parker Remond from Salem, Mass. Anybody know her name for the exam? Better read up. Um, one of the three or four bravest black abolitionists and equal rights speakers facing that double whammy. Black people weren't supposed to have political views. Women weren't supposed to have political views. She took the campaign for equal rights and anti-slavery across the ocean and was a, a big hit on the British anti-slavery lecture circuit. She shocked Victorian audiences with candid stories of what white <coughs> male slaveholders did to black enslaved women. Imagine telling that story to audiences in, in Victorian Britain. British audiences loved her. Who else we got? Now, I mentioned how whites reacted. This was such news to Murray and me. You know, we went to college. I majored in history. Um, one of the worst of the white riots against anti-slavery meetings was in our hometown, Philadelphia. Abolitionists had put together a lot of money and built one hall where they thought anti-slavery meetings and speeches could happen safely. White mobs, the white mayor, um, white Democratic leaders, Democratic Party leaders of that era decided that that hall could not stand. And in the first week when anti-slavery meetings of men and women, black and white, were going on in there, mob organized and threatened all the people in the hall and burned it to the ground. Um, and of course, there was other violence against the anti-slavery and equal rights movement in places maybe you might expect when a lot of William Lloyd Garrison's newspapers, The Liberator, turned up at a post office down in Charleston, the capital of slavery, a mob in Charleston attacked the post office and took all those mailings and burned them. That mob was led by the mayor of Charleston. When an anti-slavery preacher spoke in Tennessee, white leaders in that town had him flogged, literally whipped 50 times in the public square. When Frederick Douglass spoke to a nice big audience in, a, in an outdoor setting in Pendleton, Indiana, he's on the same lineup with a lot of great white anti-slavery speakers, and they thought the safe place to do it would be in a clearing out in the woods with a platform they'd set up. A white mob attacked the platform and pulled it to the ground while Douglas was on it. And Douglas tried to fight back with a stick, and the mob broke his arm, his right arm, the arm that he wrote with. Uh, the stories of those white mobs and the, and the better off whites who led them, and what they did, um, you know, they sweep through that whole part of the country. There were mobs in Ohio, Illinois, Detroit, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. sad to say, the Carolinas. Um, now, you wouldn't think a mob like that would happen, say, on Cape Cod, where all of us liberals like to hang out, right? Wrong! 1846, this guy, okay, back to, back to the exam prep. William Wells Brown, anyone? Wow, no one. Black abolition and equal rights leader and also one of the first published African-American novelists on earth. American publishers wouldn't take his work, so he got a British publisher to do it, and he wrote a hit novel. William Wells Brown was one of the equal rights speakers at a rally in Harwich, right up the Cape from here, what, 35 minute drive? He's one of the guest speakers at a rally in Harwich in 1848. And on the same platform with him is Lucy Stone, you know that name, great white abolitionist from Massachusetts, and a few other big names, you know, friends of William Lloyd Garrison, and a mob of thousands of men form up at the back of that scene and attack the platform when Brown is on it trying to speak, and they pull him off and he falls eight feet, and by the grace of God, only suffers minor injuries and goes on to write his novel and be a, a famous speaker. Um, So we want to give you the taste of what that might have been like if you were an anti-slavery, equal rights leader, speaker, agitator in the United States in, say, 1848. Are you sure you're done? <laughs> so, 
So, so mean to me. So mean to me. So 1848 is a year when there are a lot of abolitionists traveling to spread the word of abolition. Traveling's not so easy in 1848. You're going either by foot, by horseback, by carriage. Trains are segregated, so it's iffy if, if you can get on a train or not. Here's the story of two then very well-known black abolitionists and what happened to them in Ohio. Martin Delaney is from Pittsburgh. Martin Delaney visited Marseilles, not France's port city, but its namesake, a village in the cornfields of Northwest Ohio. Then as now, local people pronounced it Marseilles. Delaney and his Ohio contact, the light-skinned Negro abolitionist Charles H. Langston, were riding north from a meeting in Columbus and stopped at the hotel of a sympathizer in Marseilles. The sun was setting, and townsmen were pitching quoits in the main street. When they saw the two Negroes climb from a carriage, the game came to a halt. In the hotel, local men buttonholed the visitors and proposed an impromptu anti-slavery meeting at the schoolhouse. Would Delaney and Langston agree to address the meeting? How could they say no? They washed up and started for the schoolhouse. As Delaney and Langston walked, white men and boys, in Delaney's words, fell in close to our heels and followed them into the schoolhouse. Sensing a trap, they declined to speak. The man who had invited them shouted, I move we adjourn and consider this a darky burlesque. A cry went up, darky burlesque, and the swelling, almost festive crowd followed them to the hotel. Delaney and Langston watched from a window as whites lit a barrel of tar and shouted, rush in and take them, kill the niggers. Delaney could hear a thousand demonic howls along with talk of taking him and Langston South to sell them. A blacksmith forged handcuffs. Boys blew horns and banged tambourines as the fire lit the night. Delaney, who fought the Civil War, secured a butcher knife and vowed not to be taken alive. The innkeeper, and a one-armed Mexican war veteran, honest, tried to calm people down. Didn't you hear how those black fellows talk, the veteran said? These are educated Negroes. In time, the crowd's energy ebbed. And at dawn, the Negroes sprinted out. They reached their carriage amid a barrage of stones and shouted promises of death if they ever returned. Thus did a group of citizens nearly cut short Delaney's career as a doctor, orator, journalist, African explorer, and soldier, and nearly deprived the world of the poetry of Langston's future grandson, who went by the name of Langston Hughes. Um, I want to jump ahead a little bit while the abolitionists' focus was stopping slavery, they also fought many smaller battles that were, that were very important to them. They sought to integrate baseball, which was, quite frankly, from Maine to California after the Civil War. They fought to integrate literary societies cultural institutions, and streetcars, which were all over Philadelphia uh, and sort of came in tandem with the Industrial Revolution, taking people to work. The streetcars were privately owned and they were segregated. And some, some streetcars would not take any 
black riders, some would take them if they stood in the front, which was a dangerous place to stand. Even veterans of the Civil War could not ride on the streetcars. Wives, daughters, sisters who wanted to visit them in the hospital could not ride on the streetcars. After the Civil War, Octavius Caddo and colleagues sought to try to stop that. And figuring out how to do it, they used a two-pronged attack. First, they decided to use civil disobedience. And quite frankly, I don't know how they figured that out. But they got black clergymen to sit in on the streetcars and be thrown off, and they would contact the newspapers beforehand. They had students at Lincoln University, which was a brand new black college just outside of Philadelphia, to storm on the streetcars and be thrown off. Uh, they tried to get pregnant women to do the same thing. And the publicity started to turn the sentiment of the city a little bit, but the streetcar owners, quite frankly, didn't care. Their second prong was to go to Harrisburg, the state capital and try to get a law passed. Now, there are no black legislators in Harrisburg. Everyone's white. In the 1860s, blacks can't vote. You know, they, they can't vote till 1870. So they have no power. They have no clout to force them, force legislators to say, change this law. But they persist. And this effort starts to bear some fruit, and there are sympathetic ears, because there's a sense nationally, because this is going on nationally, that one day soon, one year soon, blacks are going to get the vote. And Caddo and his friends persist and persist, and finally the governor sort of moves in, in, in their favor, and a law is passed. And I want to read you what happens. <clears throat> We're in 1867. Saturday's Philadelphia Press reported that Republican Governor John W. Geary signed the bill on Friday, March 22nd. All that remained was to test the law in the streets. This was no routine matter. Older black abolitionists, men who had fought the fight in the 1830s, remember when state law had granted them the vote, but they had no shield against white men's blows at the polls. Someone respectable should test the law. Better a minister or a teacher than a washer or a maid. <coughs> Probably better a woman than a man. Someone to stand straight in a rate of words or blows. On the first Monday of spring, young women in Philadelphia were trying the new styles. Straw bonnets, chintzes, plaid silks from India, and the new hoop skirts only three yards round and much more flexible, suited to modern times, to sitting at a teacher's desk or riding in a crowded car. Under a cloudless noontime sky, the Ohio school's young principal and her assistant walked to 11th and Lombard Streets in Philadelphia, where the 10th and 11th Street Railway ran. The assistant, Alice Gordon, stood by the, as the principal flagged down the car. Her name was Carolyn LeCount, but everyone called her Carrie. Carrie caught the attention of the conductor. So these are two young black women hailing down a car that they can't ride in. The conductor's name was Edwin F. Thompson, and he looked right back at LeCount. He sneered at her, as one newspaper put it, and kept the car moving. He uttered the same words heard by the war hero, the poets, the colored soldiers, and their loved ones. The minister with his ailing boy, 
We don't allow niggers to ride. Just a month past her 21st birthday. She's a principal of a school. Carol LeCat was prepared. She promptly filed a complaint in court. She held up a copy of the press with the news that the governor had signed the law. I know nothing of a new law, the magistrate said, and I don't trust that newspaper. <laughs> Carol, this is 1867. Carol LeCount went to a state office and returned to the magistrate with a certified copy of the law. This is, again, a young black woman. There are no black women in the state courthouse, which you all know now as Independence Hall. There are very few women who, who work there. No one black works there. So this is a very gutsy move on her part. Comes back with a certified copy of the law. The conductor, Thompson, and his com company paid a $100 fine. And from then on, the streetcars in Philadelphia and throughout the state were integrated. You know, we've talked a little bit about that that amazing feat that was accomplished with just the build-up to the right to vote, that white politicians anticipated, that right down the road, bear with me, you know, powerful white politicians anticipated that if they did something right by people of color, now, once people of color got the vote, they'd reward those politicians at the polls. And then comes 1870. And all these forces come together, so-called radical white Republicans in Congress, uh, the party of Lincoln, you know, uh, marking Lincoln's martyrdom by trying to push through all these equal rights laws in Congress. As one great Republican congressman from Philadelphia, a true equal rights guy named William Kelly, said it was the rare moment when party expediency and principle coincide. <laughs> with all this pressure from people like Caddo and Douglas and the Remonds and the, and the Garnets and that handful of white allies and now this rise of radical Republicans in Congress, the, fifth, the 14th and 15th Amendments get pushed through and ratified. And next year, make a point not only of you know, voting in that little presidential election, but remembering that it's the 150th anniversary of voting rights being extended only to men of color, but it was a big step. So by the spring of 1870, there was cause for a great big voting rights march. We're all more familiar with the big voting rights march in Selma many, many, many years later where, you know, where black marchers for the simple thing of marching for the right to vote were, were cursed and stoned and attacked by police and whipped. The great John Lewis had his head laid open by state troopers and they marched on. Go back to 1870. I wish I could show you a picture of the voting rights march that Philadelphians had that spring, April 1870. They marched for five miles through the streets of Philadelphia and like those modern marchers, they had to put up with insults from white onlookers. People were throwing garbage William Kelly, that great white ally in Congress, they were carrying his portrait. By the end of the march, the Kelly portrait had been completely defaced by the garbage that white onlookers were throwing at it, but they marched anyway. And they completed the march, and when the march was over, they had a big celebration of the promise of voting rights, which everybody seemed to know was the crucial right. Caddo and other leaders of the Equal Rights League, which is sort of the forerunner, of the NAACP, wrote a few years earlier that if that one right were granted, the right to the ballot, all the other abuses and outrages would start to evaporate like the dews of morning before the morning sun. This is what it looked like in the streets of Baltimore. Thousands of people marching just to celebrate the right to vote. One of my favorite pieces of the Baltimore march, you know, we've got YouTube these days, we've got Facebook, they didn't have that back then, so what did they do? They put a printing press on a big wagon, and as the marchers moved through the streets of Baltimore, you know, a city in a state that had been south of the Mason-Dixon line and on the wrong side in the Civil War, the printing press inked 
copy after copy of the 15th Amendment that extended voting rights to men of color. Well, back in Philadelphia when the march was over and people were sort of licking their wounds and rallying in a big hall that was on Broad Street at the end of that day, Caddo spoke, uh, Lucretia Mott was celebrated. All these heroes of that era's great civil rights struggle either spoke or were honored. And there was no plan to let Frederick Douglass speak but he was at the back of the crowd. And imagine this, right? It's a packed hall in Philadelphia. There's a handful of those white allies like little Lucretia Mott and William Lloyd Garrison. But the galleries are packed with people of color celebrating the right to vote. And when Douglas is seen at the back of the hall, and you see this a lot in Douglas' career, he didn't have anything planned, but people start chanting his name. And the crowd of young black men almost body surfs him up to the stage, and he explained that he didn't have anything prepared to say. He speaks anyway, and by that time, you know, he's getting a little bit gray, and he's a revered figure for equal rights people, black and white. Um, and he tells the crowd how on that march, he, like everyone else in the line of march, could hear the insults, could feel the rotten fruit being thrown at them, could hear shots fired at them, and rocks being thrown. This is one of my favorite Douglas lines that we dug out. But he said he felt differently for once, even after all those mobs he'd had to face down in the past few decades. He said, I felt the 15th Amendment voting rights protecting me like the hide of a rhinoceros. <laughs> um, one more slide. Here we go. Now, we don't want to get all immodest, but this book that we wrote had something to do with this statue going up. <laughs> it's a little less than two years ago. This is right outside City Hall in Philadelphia. There's Octavius Caddo. You can't see it in this shot, but he is striding toward a ballot box in this statue. This is Bradley Cadet, the wonderful sculptor that we got to know, who, who designs this sculpture. If you're a Los Angeles Dodger fan, Brinley also designed the statue of Jackie Robinson outside Dodger Stadium. That's Jim Kenney, the mayor of Philadelphia, who pushed really hard to get this statue built. But that ain't all. There's Murray. <laughs> There's his wife, Libby. My daughter, Ellery, and I are back here somewhere. Now, this little white lady in pink here, some people here tonight know her. <laughs> can't her out. No, I can't get her. You can see her, the white lady in pink. That's my mom. <laughs> who once again steals the show. <laughs> she was able to make it out there and learn that history and see that unveiling at age 96. And if she could do that at 96, you all have no excuse. <laughs> Go to Philadelphia, see the statue, and when someone walks by and says, who were these people? You'll have read the book by then. So you say, well, let me tell you about those men and women of that earlier civil rights fight. Now comes our favorite part. Hit us with your questions. Thank you. I always tell my students, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So fire away, John Clayton. Uh, how did you two work together? Did you hear that? I did. Good. Yep. Everybody here, John Clayton's excellent question. Typically, I answer this question first because I'm funnier. Um, but because this is Dan's sort of home turf, try to I, stop breaking the yeah, fancy. I, I think you should answer. Wow. Well, how did we work together? It's a great question, and we get asked a lot. I think it really helped that we had both worked for many years as newspaper guys, and it had the experience of, you know, working with other reporters, uh, uh, and we both worked as both reporters and editors. So the whole process of knowing that your work, no matter how good you might think it is, uh, needs to evolve, needs to be trimmed, tightened, maybe the voice made more consistent. We were used to that. Uh, and one kind of test run we did that really helped 
Um, the Inquirer, where we worked, used to have a Sunday magazine where a lot of good writing appeared. And we talked to the woman who ran the magazine, the great Avery Rome, who was kind of our ghost editor on this whole book, into letting us work together on a quick Sunday magazine story about Octavius Cato. That was back when we thought we had a short biography. And we had a very short amount of time to get it done. And we both had just a little bit of knowledge by then about some element of Cato's life. The streetcar fight, baseball, voting rights, the war. So we split it up sort of 50-50. Murray did sort of segments 1, 3, 5, and 7, and I did 2, 4, 6, and 8. And we got it done in a week, a long, busy week. But that was a great sort of uh, test flight for working together. We thought we'd you know, need to make that work for a year. It took seven, but we still you know, get along. <laughs> and, we, and we did work at trying to make the voice consistent. Um, and we, we debated that a bit at first. Did we want to sound modern? Did we want to use the language of the era? And we, we kind of decided at some point, yes. You know, we use the N-word on purpose because people threw that word around back then and it had every bit as much sting and hate in it as it does today, but people used it more, and we wanted to convey that, and that was a decision we agreed on way early. Uh, that was Great a question. question. Um, I have a present. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Very good. Someone else. Ella. Uh, Ella or Christine. Okay. Um, Just one present per family. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, you know, the city has amended an African-American history curriculum, so what steps have you thought about taking to kind of, like, integrate into that curriculum? Fabulous question. Do that? Yeah, Dan actually knows this one, too. <laughs> <laughs> you want to start? No, go right ahead. You're welcome. You're Everybody right here, Ellis, question. It's a great question. What, what steps, if any, have been taken, especially in Philadelphia, to get this history that was hidden for generations from history books, get it taught today? Steps are underway, and we're really proud of that. A great piece of the statue going up has been a parallel push in Philadelphia public schools to teach this history. Lucky me, I got to address um, a room full of about 50 Philadelphia high school civics teachers to talk about how you could use this book in class, uh, what sort of really uh, live action things kid could, kids could engage in. The mayor pushed that cause really, really hard and often speaks eloquently about how cheated he felt having never heard of this guy going to Philadelphia schools. This guy right here, Yassin Muhammad, you know him? One of two terrific educators in Philadelphia who are leading the push to get this not only taught in Philadelphia schools, but taught in a really involving, interactive way. And to see that happen, I mean, as long overdue as it is, it is really exciting. And there are already teachers in Philadelphia public schools teaching CAT and teaching that issue. Yeah, one great thrill for us was to discover that a teacher at Masterman, you know, really good high school, was teaching that chapter where Frederick Douglass gives the rhinoceros speech. She was teaching that chapter at Masterman before we even knew who she was. That was really cool. More. Uh, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for the work you've done. Thank you. The question is that how has the African American community, and I mean that in a really broad sense, both you know, those academics, those who write, those from community who responded to the work you've done? I got this one. Um, we were concerned about that. We were concerned about the reaction we'd get because we were white. And uh, I would say that 99% of the reaction has been wonderfully positive. Um, we've spoken at, at a number of black churches and the reaction we get is thank you, I want my children and grandchildren to know this story, and they don't. Um, and it's actually been easier than we thought. Um, I'll tell you 
one funny story. We spoke at a public high school, and after we were all done, one of the 10th or 11th grade students who was African American asked us rather boldly, and it was impressive, whether either of us had ancestors who owned slaves. It's kind of a striking question. question. Now, Dan's wife had actually the told us that was going to her. happen. And I quite frankly didn't pay much attention. And Dan, why don't you tell them how you reacted to that? I congratulated this 10th grade kid and said, you know, my wife predicted years ago that Mary and I were going to need to know the answer to that because somebody was going to ask. And, and uh, I checked a little bit and being, you know, a, a biddle or at least, you know, half biddle. I, <laughs> yes, I said my family almost undoubtedly owned some people way back when. And then you. Yeah, I, and I, I said, nope, you know, that didn't happen. And then I asked the young man, how about your family? Did your ancestors ever own slaves? And he looked at me like I was a crazy man. But fortunately, the other kids in the classroom told him, reminded him that they had been taught that there were black slave owners in the South. And it, so it became a wonderful sort of educational moment for everyone. Someone else? Uh, yes, sir. I know you. This is a wonderful talk. And, Thank you. Uh, I expect to enjoy the book a lot too. But did Cattle leave any written uh, documentation, journals, or anything? Himself? Great question. You, Great question. Working all over secondhand information. Well, you know, we both wish that he had left more. Yeah. Uh, no diaries that we know of. We fought like cats to get, and Leonard helped us. The great Leonard Smith tried to get a an aunt of his. Leonard and his whole family grew up in Detroit, and he still had a lot of relatives there. And this aunt, the whole family lore was that uh, this one aunt had a whole cubbyhole in her house in Detroit full of family papers, including Caddo stuff. And she and Leonard did not get along. <laughs> On our behalf, Leonard goes out there, this is years ago, and hangs out with her for a few days. And, there, and, she, and he knew her son, and they were... Good buddies, but Dan, you know, they, they didn't get along. And he, this is so something or other. He, he gets her at the kitchen table and, and starts into the question, you know, Aunt so and so, the cubby, as she called it, with all that old family cattle stuff. And as he asked the question, the lights went out. It was the Midwest blackout of 2000, and I think, four. And he had to spend the next 48 hours taking care of this aunt who lived alone and who lost her power. And he was never able to complete the question. Um, so if there's a Caddo diary, we didn't get to it. There is a good, good collection in Philadelphia that Caddo's surviving friends made a point of saving and keeping in a collection. And that's got a few of his letters. There's a few really good speeches that turned up in one of the great black papers of that era, the Christian Recorder. Frederick Douglass wonderfully wrote about the Caddo family in Douglass's newspapers. And there's one, I mean, you gotta buy the book to read this one. There's a great Caddo letter to a friend and fellow baseball player in Philadelphia in the late summer of 1869 that says, in essence, we're getting ready to play a white team. Recruit your best people. And by the way, I'm writing from down the shore. You should have come down. We're having a great time down here. <laughs> yeah, there's a baseball chapter in the book. And Caddo and his team, the team is called the Pythians, play a white team called the Olympics yeah. in September 3rd, 1869 in Philadelphia. And it is the first black-white baseball game in America it appears on the front page of the New York Times two days later. It appears in the Deseret News in Utah. It's big news around the country. Caddo, we imagine, hoped that the game would lead to the integration of baseball. Well, that doesn't happen until 1947 and another black second baseman named Jackie Robinson. But it does lead to black-white exhibition games all over the country. 
and they start in Boston and Philadelphia and New York and everywhere. Uh, but I mean, then I wonder how the nation would have changed if, in fact, baseball is integrated in 19, 1869. Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, so really wonderful talk. Um, and conversation, and one of the things that triggers for me is this bigger question. You know, I find myself listening to this and feeling so, um, like, deprived that we don't know this, and this is just like a fraction of what we don't know, and the injustice that you're speaking to is just a fraction of the bigger history. So I'm, I'm just really curious how this leaves you thinking you sort of get historians here, kind of unearthing <laughs> this really precious history. With the perspective you have, you know, how do you think about you know this national conversation on race that needs to happen? Great question. And how do we help? Make, I mean, clearly this is a piece of it, and this is an inroad, and it's really important. I'm curious how you think <laughs> that can be magnified, and does that, in your mind, connect at all to the issue of reparations? as a vehicle for creating a national conversation on this. Do you have a tougher question you could ask? <laughs> <laughs> really, that's a, it's, a, I, I, I it's just a profound that. question. I mean, a line I always like to use, and of course forgot to tonight, the point of this book is to change that. People don't know these stories. We still, we still don't know one one hundredth of this. But now it's there in archives. It's there in wonderfully digitized old newspapers and whatnot, and something I love telling my students is, they can do the next book. They'll find a Henry Highland Garnett of a, uh, so many heroic people who came across and thought she should have been a book. The great Fanny Jackson Coppin, who led Caddo School and Coppin State University in Maryland. I mean, I would, I think one step would be to really overhaul the way a lot of our racial history does get taught and challenge, you know, current faculty and students to say, what are you learning from this? What tactics did they use? How might they apply today? What, what can we learn from the battles that they fought and lost and the battles they fought and won? And maybe, I don't know if this goes more to your question, what echoes do you hear of these battles in modern politics? When President Trump says four women elected to Congress need to go back home, that is a loud and clear echo of what these women and men had to put up with. Organized campaigns to send them back to Africa. Big money from the North and the South. Oh, they'll be better off with them. That still upsets me. <laughs> and, I mean, one of the great acts of bravery on the part of Cato, and even more, his father and his father's generation, was to fight off that so-called colonization movement and say, we're here, we're Americans now, and much as, as King said in his greatest speech, the promise that was made in the Declaration of Independence about equal rights, that check is going uncashed and it's time for the nation to, to so cash. Our reactions are, are multiple and rather diverse. Because we saw how bad it was in the 19th century, some of my reaction is, it's so much better now. Uh, these people don't understand how bad it was. Now, that's absolutely true, but it doesn't answer your question. The other thing is that Caddo statue, Philadelphia has more public statuary so by a wide margin than any other city in the United States. Okay? The statue of Caddo is the first statue on public land in Philadelphia of a single named African American. After it's outrageous! After 300 years. That is absolutely outrageous. <laughs> and nothing's happened in the last two years, so I, I, I don't know of, a, of a, another statue going up. Um, the people in this movement, unfortunately, didn't write the history books. And the reconstruction history of the United States and the history kind of on the streets of the North, it's relatively recent that historians have paid attention to it. 
If I ask you to talk about African Americans in the United States in the 1800s, you're going to talk to me about slavery because that's all we've been taught. This is a book that actually isn't about slavery, though we have slavery in the book. You can't avoid it. It's about free African Americans who are free in name only. Um, and yeah, I mean, what Dan said is, is absolutely correct. We'd love for this to change it, even if it's only a little. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have two, two questions. First point, um, we're both on my wife from Philadelphia, and uh, I want to board down there. Can you speak as loud as you possibly can? Uh, we're both from Philadelphia. I'm on a board down there that's called the Book of Alliance for Drug Education, King Kids. It's been around actually for like about 30 years now. Uh, the chairman of the program is the Phillies. You think about tires with all the work you do here. Uh, he actually started the, uh, started the foundation with three other sports teams down there. The reason why I bring this up is that we have counselors that go to the uh, 30 most stressed schools in Philadelphia and, of course, they're in the worst of the neighborhoods, and we're always looking for ways to improve the young, young folks' self-esteem. And really, you know, in, a, in a way, um, this is all about how they deal with life and how they deal with their social problems and how in a non-violent way to begin a discussion and deal with, you know, just all the pressures that they have. And I'm thinking about this as a way that our counselors can talk to the kids in the schools about, hey, think about what these folks had to go through, you know, all their lives in terms of how they dealt with these huge problems. And now think about what you're dealing with now, bullying or addiction or whatever, you know, you know gambling or whatever you're dealing with now. This would be a heck of a great way. Well, I, I think you're right. I think, you know, a, a word that is used a lot these days is agency. You know, people uh, confronting their situation and doing something about it. Yeah. People in his generation, I mean, we were awed at how, you know, having grown up in the 60s, we grew up thinking, our generation grew up thinking we could change the world. You hear that theme over and over in the writings and speeches, even the song lyrics that Cato and the men and women of his generation said or wrote. They were, even though they were teenagers growing up in 1850s America, they thought they were going to change the world, and damn it, they did. Yeah, and think, exactly. Think about this as an inspiration for all these young people that are going through this. Teenagers. Teenagers. His, his best friend at age 18 confronted the governor of Pennsylvania with an equal rights speech in 1855. That would have been hard for a black kid to do in Philadelphia in 1955. And the second quick point. That's agency. Um, to what extent... Uh, Sorry, Ms. First of all, Mr. Speecher, but to what extent did did your book cross over to the Negro Leagues, and did this uh, have any effect on um, the people who eventually Cato came in contact with, and then on up in, in terms of them fulfilling history? Uh, I'm not going to take this occasion to brag that we got to do a speech at Cooperstown in the Baseball Hall of Fame. It is pre-Negro League era. It's about 30 years before yeah. the Negro Leagues. On the bright side, though, so to speak, they had a hell of a league. They had a black baseball league in this country by the end of the Civil War that had teams in Harrisburg, Chicago, Boston, uh, Baltimore, Washington. I mean, you got to buy the book. Because that's, I think, chapter, <laughs> chapter 13. And you'll learn that you'll read about how when they play their game in Washington, and Cato's team was a terrific team, uh, one of the teams they played against had a guy playing in the outfield who was a pretty good player too, and his dad was in the stands for the games. So that would be Frederick Douglass's kid. Charles. Actually, he was an infielder. Dan so, I thought he said outfield. Infield. Yeah. So, so <laughs> it was a hell of a list. They were good. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.
great speech. And when you buy the book, I especially recommend, I especially recommend chapter 14, where you will get a, a dose of how this myth of vote fraud and the need for voter ID, how white racist Democratic leaders used that nonsense in the 1860s. Elizabeth, we got a lot of ringers here today. Tom Holtzman. As you started to research this, did you find any awareness at all in the African American community in Philadelphia of these people and the movement that your book describes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Plenty. So yes. There, there were oral histories and things handed down. Yes. Older black men and women knew who Kata was. Great moment but, for but a just older. learning moment. Yeah. There, there was a great columnist and before that investigative reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Asel Moore, rest in peace, who really pioneers the integrating of the Inquirer newsroom and, and had lived in Philadelphia for many, many years. When our little magazine piece came out with Cato on the cover, I'll never forget this, Asel sees us in the newsroom and shouts, he says, I see you all discovered will be Cato. <laughs> I think that's known now as referring to the white gaze. You know, it's like we're still, you know, we, we don't we don't know. We can learn a lot, but but there's still plenty that plenty left to be learned. I'm sorry, you, you had a question. I I just was following up the lady back here. Sure. There's a wonderful book that I'm reading right now, Just Mercy. Oh you know, by Brian, Brian uh, Stevenson. Stevenson. And it sort of follows up Second person has <laughs> pointed out to me yes. that I need to read that book. I promise I'll read it. Really, I, I hear nothing to read. Yeah, no, that book's not available tonight. That's right. <laughs> but for a low, low price. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. What was Adam's status when he was born? How was he educated? Wow. Well, well you know, you got it. It's only $10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next Briefly. Briefly. He's born in South Carolina. His father is a free man, so he's free. And just about every southern state had small groups of free black men and women. And it was a little larger in Charleston because it was a bigger city. Um, his father was very much in, involved in the church. And it was kind of a... I don't know, a, a, a lay minister, and they had to be very careful about that because he was African American, so he took care of other African Americans, and, um, and he become, we know he becomes educated when they move to Philadelphia when he's nine. Do we know he's about education in Charleston? Not much. Yeah. I mean, we know that his dad somehow, even with that law against black learning, his dad uh, gets himself illiterate by the time he's in his 30s and is writing stuff on behalf of black worshipers and black sort of community leaders in the context of Charleston, a, a slavery capital. So, we, I mean, I wish we could show you a picture of his dad. We're unable to find one. But he was quite a guy. And we think his mom, Cato's mom, her background is, we think, exotic also, as a, a child of a mulatto, as it was said back then, family in Charleston that had obtained wealth and ran a lumber yard in the port and owned people. That was said to be her family background. Yeah, I would guess that his father educated him as, as a, a small boy. But I can't prove that. And then from age nine? He was, he was here and, and he went to school. In Philly. He went to school in Philly and in, and in New Jersey. What and and one thing, pardon? What sort of school? Do we have that slide? I don't think we do. It's going to get the ICR slide. Yeah. He, now you really got to buy the book. 
The yeah, school was called the Institute for Colored Youth. It was an experiment that wealthy Quakers put together, uh, thinking they knew how to educate uh, kids of color. Black leaders in Philadelphia, including Caddo's dad, uh, pushed to reshape that school and make it a true academic school. The rich Quaker notion was to teach them broom making and carpentry and farming and, and whatnot. And the parents were like, they know how to do that. We want to arm them with scholarship and education and, and have kids able to talk on their feet and argue and debate. I mean, it was almost like there was a conscious sense. We want them to grow up to be activists. And it's a hell of a school. You got you to buy the book. You know, <laughs> we should stop it's, hell of it's school. 10 of 9 and people are falling asleep. And they want to buy books. Corinne, yes. Corinne, yes. Well, I love this talk and I love watching the two of you authors, you know, sort of sparring up there. <laughs> what I'd like to know is what was the most difficult challenge you faced as um, collaborators and how did you resolve? <laughs> it's the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> um, you know what? There weren't any terrible challenges or fights. I disagree. <laughs> Just a joke. Um, since we, we both were both editors and reporters, as Dan mentioned, the editing part of it, and Dan edited me and I edited Dan, was just like working at the newspaper, except the stories were longer. Um, the writing um, was hard, but we both did it, and neither of us was afraid to say, it could be shorter, it could be longer, you could do it better, and invariably, one of us was right. Um, <laughs> the end notes might have been the worst yes. couple of days. And the and end notes, have that and in bad. fact, if our wives don't help us, and sort of do it, quite frankly, um, we, we fall apart crying in a, a little fetal position. It was very hard. We just, we just screwed up entirely. And I think Ellery is a teenager, and if we asked Ellery, she could have done it. But, but we, we, we just, we couldn't get it together. Yes. Yes. No. no. So, so, so that was very, very hard. Right. I mean, Our decision to use 19th century technology. Probably. Yeah, I mean, we didn't tell the publisher it's going to take us seven years. I mean, we told them it would take one, and we just kept, you know, it just took longer and longer. Some of it because one of us is slow, and some of it because we kept learning more. Yeah. We kept, it kept being a bigger story. Last question, is that okay, please? No, sir. Yes. Thank um, since you've gotten back to the topic of process, uh, I was very, I mean, it's great that you are doing this clearly as something that really needs to be done, and um, a lot of benefits are flowing from it and will continue, I'm sure, indefinitely to flow from it. I was very taken by your question before about you guys being white and how did black people react to the fact that you were when you wrote this. And I was just curious, as part of the process, at some point with your drafts, did you actually go to uh, black individuals that you respected and ask them to look at this so that you would have another kind of a, you know, framework? To another them? great question. Um, we certainly had great allies, historians of color, who I'm, not, I'm trying to remember if, if we handed any one of them the book to read back. We had, I mean, we had a, a really distinguished, I know this sounds lame, but a woman at, at uh, UMass who is a leading, leading historian of, of that era and that struggle and a great moment of the life. I mean, she's white, British, but she wrote a fabulous biography of a, of a leading black man in Philadelphia and her giving us kind of a, an A on our manuscript. That was a big thing. But yeah, academic but publishers generally uh, throw out the manuscripts that writers write to to three or four right. readers, and she was one of the readers, and she liked it a great deal. I think we and, ran a lot of it past Emma, who's I mean, there's yes. a black historian Emma Lapsansky Werner who really was a pioneering 
historian on a slightly yeah. earlier year, but not as old. We didn't give the finished manuscript right. to anyone who was African American. We gave it to historians. You gave it to Leonard. Uh, we gave it to Leonard, yeah, yes, who's the relative. A great moment early yes. on was when Leonard said to us over lunch that a lot of people in his family did not want him to help us. That he had relatives who said, you know, white people have screwed the story up forever. Why don't you take it to Hollywood? You don't need them. And he shared that with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was our fast ally on this from that day on. And, was just and still is. God's it's just a very nice man. Who was your audience for the book then? Our audience? Yeah, I mean, really. It, it, You're in it. Uh, no, but I, it's interesting because I have an academic background and, and I know the process when you go through a book and it's, and it's read, reviewed, it's scrutinized, and mm -hmm. destroyed sometimes by the target audience and those who are all going to be the users and the readers as well as the subjects. So I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just sort of, uh, not taken back, that's a little too over the top, but surprised that that there was an interest in, in getting uh, a response or a deliberate effort made to uh, approach those whose life, story, history uh, you're writing about. Does my question make sense? Yeah, I mean, there are blurbs on the book by African Americans. But I'm just trying to be honest with you, we never gave the complete manuscript to anyone who was a, a black historian because I think we didn't know anyone who was appropriate. Oh, no. Yes. Ouch. Yes. That's an ouch. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't know anyone who was, yeah, uh, who was an historian of the 19th century. That's what I'm saying. Well, a historian of the 19th century who was. Anything about African American Academics who reviewed the book are. I mean, you're not told. I mean, we found out the, the woman that Dan mentioned because we know her, and she saw us at a, a literary event, and she came up and told us about it. So there may have been two African. I mean, I, I, I have no idea. And I, and hearing what you're saying, I would imagine that that the publisher did do that. But I mean, but, 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 uh, yes. I guess it also the burden of not being of the community per se. There is a burden on the responsibility that comes with it. Absolutely. Be, you know, I'm not. Let me just make it very clear. I think the work you've done as a contribution is not to be challenged. That's not the issue. It's more about the approach of the process and how it affects communities of color per se. Not to be actively engaged with them in a way. And, and not leave it up to your publishers, but to see that as part of the process, part of the, the ability to show you capture the portrayal, the analysis, the uh, information in a way that resonates and has that greater depth. Your, your, your point, point is a good one. Yes. It's 9 o'clock. Oh, yes. No, don't no, worry. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.